and product specialist. Now, Steve will be sharing with us how we can stop being swamped by work that we shouldn't be doing. So as I've now got two roles as CEOs, um, I'm very much looking forward to this session. So um, I think you're there, Steve, are you? I am indeed. Hi, Tessa. Hi, how are you? Very well, very well, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much for joining us. I think we can see your screen already, so um, I will disappear and pop myself on mute. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Tessa. That's great. OK, so, yeah, so <clears throat> what I'm going to be talking to you about today is automating processes with Hornbill, uh, very much to say on the theme of stop being swamped by work you should not be doing. Uh, and for Hornbill, this is very much about marrying IT service management with IT operations management, providing you there with seamless automation experiences. So I'm going to talk briefly about the why and the what to automate, but the majority of this session will be a demonstration on the how uh, with Hornbill. So <clears throat> thinking about the why, I'm sure none of this will come as a complete surprise to you, but you know, in basic terms, we're looking to obviously replace repetitive manual tasks, so freeing up staff for, for more high value initiatives. We're looking to reduce errors through processing and, and doing this through process consistency. Uh, we're also looking to reduce processing times by um, uh, involving uh, automation as part of that. Uh, but ultimately, obviously this um, wraps itself up in you know what sort of return on investment can we get what sort of positive impact uh, from automation can we see uh, across the business and from some research that was done by one of the leading um, technology analyst groups it returned some i would say sort of expected results but also some some unexpected sort of benefits from from automation so of course we're looking to reduce it workload of course that's going to result in uh, a reduction in human ticket interactions, it's going to increase our productivity capability. Um, but interestingly as well, it's also going to free uh, or increase end user productivity, the, the time that can be saved where they're not waiting for processes to be completed because we're automating this for them. And of course, as a result of that, we're also then gaining um, better customer satisfaction as well. So there's some very obvious, but maybe not so, so, so obvious ones as, uh, as well. What probably is very obvious is the fact that the more of our processes that we are able to automate, the higher that return on investment, the wider that impact and the benefit to the business uh, can be. What I did also want to do is just sort of touch on one example of a customer in Hornbill and, and their sort of experience here of, of utilising and marrying service management and, and operations management together. When they joined Hornbill, they had immediate problems on the left hand side here, they had an immediate requirement and by deploying both service management and operations management, they were able to uh, automate their end to end new startup process, deploy applications, um, automate uh, releases via Hornbill and that resulted in a very tangible saving over 500 hours in that first 90 days. Now, they're not stopping there, they've already identified um, automation opportunities through Hornbill that's going to increase those time saved by sort of four or five fold and, and examples of the, of the types of things that they're going to look to um, to automate would be, you know, access requests, whether it's network shares, distribution groups, uh, etc. Fully automating those is going to really drive up those hours saved um, across the business. OK, now with that in mind, thinking about how Hornbill do that and what you would look to automate. As I say, it's very much about that relationship between service management and, and operation management so that you have a, a seamless automation um, experience. And with Hornbill, you can achieve that with both integration and automation with your cloud services and integration and again, automation with those uh, services, applications, systems that you're using on prem behind the firewall. And we achieve that in a number of different ways. And um, through the cloud, we have um, an iBridge uh, service that hooks into those cloud services and behind the firewall. Uh, we'd utilize a site integration server, which will be what will actually execute those jobs and those automations with your uh, your local systems. But all of that is, is driven and controlled through your, your native uh, cloud service on there. What that then looks like when you talk about using it in Hornbill from a service management perspective is the ability for you to automate those actions as part of your uh, your ticket processes, your service requests, your changes, your problems, your incidents. So utilizing that at points in time. You can also utilize these and invoke these with buttons on forms. So we have a feature called auto tasks that lets you to, to run these as and when you need them from buttons. 
And the third option would be looking at scheduling these. So if you've got daily, nightly, weekly, monthly um, actions that can be automated, then you can also schedule uh, and run and manage those uh, through the Hornbill platform. In terms of the what, well, we provide a library, um, packages uh, extending to over 75 different uh, products that are out there, cloud and behind the firewall uh, on here. And it'd be these obviously integration of these systems that we then like look to automate actions on. The typical things that you might be looking to do here uh, would be, you know, creation of user accounts, adding people in and out of groups, removing them from groups. It could be integrations and collab um, collaborating with other service management tools. You might have internal teams that are using you know, Jira, for example, or you might have external suppliers that are using different service management platforms and you want to automate the creation of ticket or passing of tickets to them if you if you need to in certain contexts. You might also want to be automating the uh, communication channels that you use. So whether you're on Teams or Slack or Yammer uh, or just SMS um, or email, you can automate the sending of communications to those platforms or it could extend out to automating the sending of contracts through DocuSign as part of your uh, onboarding processes. The, you know, the automation opportunities are massive. It's really sort of filtering down and thinking about which are the ones that are gonna give you uh, most uh, return on your value, uh, return on, on your investment uh, in here. And with that in mind, I'm gonna focus very much now on, on two examples, two of the very sort of low hanging fruit, if you will, on here. And that's looking at your joiners, movers, leavers process. And it's looking at your access requests. So what I'm going to step through is a joiners process that's going to demonstrate how automation can complement your orchestration of the process. So how it can work and sit alongside routing rules, uh, task management, approvals, um, integrated tickets, all of that. So I'm going to show you that example so we can see how it works. And then the second example is going to be very much about a completely automated process where our IT teams don't need to have any involvement. Uh, whatsoever in that process, just so we can get a feel for both. And once I've shown them, I'm going to show you exactly how you configure those in our process designer. Okay. Now, the first example, the joiner process, I'm going to um, do some automation with both Azure AD and behind the firewall AD. So hopefully we're covering everyone that might be in the cloud, for example, directory services, they might be on-prem, they might have a hybrid model. Hopefully this example will sort of cover, uh, cover that for everybody. And once we finish, we'll come back and, and if there's any questions, then Tessa can um, sort of field those at the end for us. OK, so with that in mind, I'm just going to come over to minimize that panel for a second and go into self-service where we can initiate these requests. So we'll just come in as Tom uh, on here. Now, Tom works in the, the business. He might be um, a department head and as such, he might have access to um, our HR environment he might have access to the HR services and as part of that the ability to onboard uh, new employees so what we're dropping into here is a simple data capture form to get the information about the person that's going to be joining the business so we'll just fill in the basics on here Lee Jones uh, in a particular role joining on a particular date uh, joining a particular function at a particular site now of course with these data capture forms that you can configure um, having well-defined personas in terms of what you need to fulfill, you can tie to things like roles, but obviously if, you, if you're not there yet and you need to um, get the requester to specify exactly what systems and hardware they should be entitled to, then of course you can take either approach with these data capture forms. But ultimately where we're getting to is that that's going to generate in this example a, a service request. That service request is going to have a fulfillment business process and that business process is going to be represented in terms of the progress across that process by this heads up display at the top. Now what I've deliberately done here is paused that process in the first stage as the requester so that we can go and pick that up as a team that might be fulfilling on this and see what happens in the second stage. So to do that I'm just going to switch over here to, to Graham who's part of my first line support team and he's been notified about that service request. He's going to come in, pick that up and he's going to take ownership of it. <clears throat> now in doing so, that moves the process forward and we're going to see a number of things that are happening here. From a manual perspective, it can demonstrate that we can create sequential or parallel tasks that might still be needed as part of this in terms of configuring equipment and allocating mobiles. But in the background, what we're doing is we're going off and we're going to be creating the user, as I say, in AD or Azure. We're going to spin them up in, in Hornbill. We're going to allocate them some roles. 
some rights and then we're going to look at doing things like um, adding them to groups and then we might invoke things like ad connect to automate uh, integration with your um, office 365 or your exchange online um, to achieve these integrations so i never suggest you do this in a live environment but for demo purposes i've just brought back the credentials that have been returned to me from those integration calls and if we go off to our um, ad environment on here and if we just do a refresh of our uh, ad we can see that lee has been added and if we go into our sales group we can see that lee's been added into that group uh, for us and for those of you as i say that are in the cloud we've done exactly the same here for our azure users on here so lee jones has been added uh, automatically into that um, as well but coming back to the ticket i did want to talk a little bit about how that automation can sit aside alongside orchestration uh, on here so we can go ahead and for example complete the task to configure the equipment we can then obviously then um, uh, uh, have automation happening after manual tasks and alongside them so here we might have deployed software or made an app available in the portal for that new user uh, you may well still have things that you need to to manually do like installing software again it's up to you to understand what you're looking to to automate and finally you know are we going to give them a mobile now i'm going to say no on this occasion because it's also very apparent to me that you know join as movers leavers it's not exclusively an it exercise there are other teams within your business that need to participate in those processes so in this example here what we're also demonstrating is the ability to this example automatically create a linked request as part of that process design and allocate that request off to our colleagues in facilities for them to fulfill on the parts of the process that they're responsible for so if i just introduce john here who is our facilities guy he's got a uh, a ticket that's been sent to him automatically and as a result as part of that he's got the information that's relevant to him for him to then go ahead and be able to issue in this example a security pass and once we've done that then we might go ahead uh, and issue uh, the parking permit for that particular new starter as well given the, the fact we know which site we're at the process can then automatically resolve and close down uh, john's request but it can also come back up and it can talk to the parent ticket it can update from an audit perspective all the actions that were performed on that uh, child ticket and as a result of that it can also move this process forward and it can mark those security pass and parking permit tasks as being completed now i did mention as well that i wanted to sort of briefly sort of integrate levers as part of this process now obviously in the real world you'd never uh, involve your levers process as part of your new starters process but what i have done here just in my demo uh, process uh, is just actually then come in here and remove those users from the system so we can see that lee has now gone and he's no longer a member of that ad uh, group and likewise if we come over here to azure uh, we can see that lee is no longer in our uh, users but he is in our uh, deleted users group and this happened in real time so again it's just really saying whether it's joiners movers or leavers that can all be facilitated now the second example i talked about was where we don't you know necessarily want, want or need any involvement from our it colleagues so we'll go back to self-service and we'll go back to a user that might be working from home might have access to our working from home service and, and catalog and it might be here where they've got the options to uh, request network share access or be added to a distribution list or a distribution group and what we can do here is actually facilitate that and say okay well what are you wanting to be added to what's your reason for being uh, added so i might have a, a new wrong uh, is it a temporary uh, access if so until when if it's permanent great we can um, go and uh, initiate that request now what we want to do here through the automation is actually not involve it at all we can allow the user to make that request in the background we can look up which group or access is being required who owns that within the business because it aren't necessarily going to know that or um, they have to go and look it up and manually involve it so what we can do here is look up that owner we can then automatically send out the approval to that owner get their approval and move it forward what that means in real terms in this example um, here if we come to our ad is that in our distribution groups under marketing for example we can see that this is actually managed by harry hornbill so we need harry's approval to move uh, tom into our uh, members of that particular group obviously i'm in there uh, at the moment so if we come back to that um, request on here we can see at the top i've got access to harry hornbill's uh, email he's been uh, sent a uh, access request approval if we go to on that email and action it now we can see the information that's available to harry so 
via variables we've injected who's asking for access, what they're asking for access to, why they need access based on what they've submitted, and obviously from here, Harry can either decide to approve, reject, whatever his prerogative is. From that point, obviously that process will then move on. If it's rejected, maybe we pass on the rejection information back to Tom. If it's approved, we mark it as approved, we go ahead, we perform that action in the background and we auto close off that ticket. But again, we haven't had to involve IT in that at all. But if we come back into marketing here, then we can see that Tom has been added to the group as a result of Harry giving us that approval. So that's very much what it looks like at the front end, but how do we go about achieving that? So I'm just gonna go into the uh, admin tool and the process design here, and I'm gonna start by having a look at our new starter example that we ran. This uh, environment here is a drag and drop environment and it's still node driven, there's no sort of coding involved in here, but you can see the three stages that we had. We can see things like nodes that represent uh, automations in terms of routing rules to teams, to individuals, round robin, most available, those types of options. But the interesting part is really when we drop into the fulfillment stage and we can see the parallel processing happening here. So we can see at the top, the manual tasks being orchestrated, but at the bottom, we can see the automation taking place. Now in this first node here, which is a generate password, if we're creating a new user account, we're probably gonna to need to create a temporary password. We can utilize a utility and we can comply with your corporate policy around the complexity of that password needed, for example, for Azure or AD or any other system. And you can have as many of those different nodes in the same process for different systems as you, as you see fit. The second node on here is then the creation of that user in Azure. And this is leveraging our library. Oh, it's a good opportunity just to dive into that. So these are the library of the integrations that you've got that you can then perform automations on. So whether that's starting and stopping instances uh, in Amazon, whether that's uh, pushing dev calls off to your dev teams or looking up who's on call through Ops Genie, automating remote control sessions, sending off uh, documents in DocuSign, uh, collaborating with teams or other uh, collaboration platforms. But ultimately what we're doing here is looking at the Azure options for creating, deleting, resetting passwords. It could of course have been the group options for adding, removing, getting owner details. And we're just making our selection. I wanna create a user. From that point onwards, we're just injecting variables into this ticket. So the most complicated it's gonna be is saying, well, I need to look back at the data capture form, or I need to look at a previous node to inject an output parameter. So in this example here, I'd just say, for the new password, I wanna to go to the previous node, generate password, and inject the temporary password that would have been created for me. And that's the same process if I'm doing that for creating a user in, in AD. We're looking at the out of the box packages for managing Active Directory users or managing group policy. We're choosing what we want to do, enable, disable, reset password. And then we're filling in the credentials that are needed to perform that action. And we're getting those credentials from previous forms or data capture forms in the process. And when we've done that, we're gonna add them to groups. And ultimately in my example, we're gonna remove them from groups using things like their user principal name that we'd have pulled through from those nodes. The second example, which I just wanted to, to touch on uh, on here, I'll just save this process, on here was what we did with the uh, distribution group example uh, on here. So in this one, we've done slightly different. So we've, we've gone off and got the data capture information and loaded it into the process. The first thing we then needed to do is see, well, actually, which group do we need to go and look up who the owner is? So in this one, for the variable, we've just gone into the variable picker We've gone to our data capture form. We've looked at the questions that we asked, which distribution group do you wanna do? And we've just then gotta go ahead and inject that answer to that question into that field as a variable. Simple as that to do that, those options. Once we've done that, that's then gonna give us who the managed by is as an output parameter. So we're gonna wait for that. The second thing we're then gonna do is say, okay, well, we're gonna use the variable picker to look back at the first one and say, well, actually, who is it managed by? And we're gonna pull that through because we need to know from the managed by what their email address is. Once we've got that as an output parameter, we can inject that into our approval as the recipient for that email. We can use the variable picker to put some information in about um, uh, the details that they're gonna be approving. They make their approval decision. And if, we're ha if they're able to approve it, again, we're just coming, adding that user to a group. And the two variables that are needed here are the answer to the data capture form, and the, the uh, member based on who the customer of that request is. So the most complex it's ever gonna get is using this business process designer to draw out what you want and pull uh, variables through 
from your processes uh, and your data capture forms. So at that point, I'm going to um, come back uh, and ask Tessa if there was uh, any questions that have been posed, uh, and also just to highlight, if you did want to know more about the why and what you can automate, my colleague Pat Bolger uh, did a presentation with the SDI during the experience day earlier in the month, and he goes into great de detail about the why. So you know, if you've got access to that resource, then I would, I'd heartily recommend it. Sorry, Tessa. No, absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Steve. That's great. Yeah, I do have a couple of questions for you, actually. Um, the first question is, um, I think when you were looking at the business process slide and you're using that as your example, um, mm -hmm. somebody posted a question that said, hi, can this integrate with Microsoft DevOps? Yeah, absolutely. We've got um, out of the box examples um, of integrating with DevOps, whether that's creating the releases or items in those releases. That's yeah, absolutely included in the library that we provide. Fabulous. And then I have another question, which is, is the CMDB slash CMS automatically updated in this workflow? And what if we could change the CMDB model? OK, hopefully if I've been interpreting that correctly, then, yeah, absolutely. Using the business process designer, then um, whether it's a joiner or a lever that may have CIs assigned to them, then using that process designer, absolutely, you can bring things, if you like, back into a stock status. You can reassign the used by or owned by um, attributes of the, um, of the CI and the CMDB. And of course, that's updated automatically uh, in real time. And there's a full history of any of those, those changes in the same way if you'd, if you'd updated those attributes manually. OK, fabulous, brilliant. Um, and another question for you is, um, what skills and where do you go to get the skills to do the automation? Is there a Hornbill admin course to complete? Sure. So the level of the skills, we're certainly we're aiming um, at your process designers to be able to do these, these integrations, hopefully through that, the demonstration. Um, and the visibility of that process designer here, you could see that it was really just drawing out nodes and, and adding in values um, to those nodes. Of course, Hornbill provides various training um, uh, courses on all aspects. So whether it's the actual process orchestration or whether it's the um, uh, operation management configuration, we, we provide uh, courses on both. OK, brilliant. Lovely. Thank you. And. Um, Another question here is, when building the flows, is there a library of the variables for reference? Uh, absolutely. So obviously the variables will, that present themselves will be dependent on what you've actually got in your in your uh, process. So it will be looking okay. at the um, nodes that precede it in that workflow. So if, for example, as I had, I was generating a random password, when I get to the next node and I do a lookup, it will show me all of the available nodes and all of their available variables there and then. So um, there isn't, uh, as you say, really a need for a uh, extensive list of the variables because it's all just dynamic based on what's in your process when you're building it. OK, brilliant. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, and one final question. Does the solution allow for multi-tenancy? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the context. I'm not sure, Tess, if it's um i might let's uh, let's just that is the that, i'm hoping that perhaps somebody might add some more context to that for us i have had another question actually um which i'm going to ask um at the q a session at the end because um somebody's asked what's the diff the main difference between hornbill and kelvron so i'll i'll ask that at the q a session to give um both uh, hornbill and kelvron the opportunity to um answer in sure. one go so I'll, I'll do that then um i think that's it in terms of questions i don't think you're joining us um for the q a later steve are you? i think but pat's going to join at about 1 30 today is that okay absolutely yeah. pat, pat will be joining us for that as i say um he, he obviously did the uh the why content with you earlier in the month so yeah he's, he's well placed to answer any questions as well Brilliant, lovely. Well, we'll cover off uh, more questions at the Q&A. Can I just take this opportunity to say thank you very much, Steve, for joining us today. That was really good. And thank you very much for um, answering all the questions. That was great. So um, take care and thanks for joining us. No problem at all. Thank